Okay, so, so officially, welcome to the Core Knowledge Hub webinar number two, the second one in the series. And today we'll be focusing a tiny bit on looking into gender transformative services, having a bit of an introduction of what is that all about. So there is three amazing, fantastic speakers that today will be sharing their experiences from three different positions. We'll have Christiana, we'll have Amanita, and we'll have Aura, that they will come later. But before, maybe to give you just a tiny bit of the context, Oh, first, housekeeping rules, as you have been reading. Uh, as you might have noticed, the event is recorded. So the idea is to be able to disseminate and to actually make more accessible all this content for people that cannot be donated here. So it will be in the core website. Try to be in mute while you uh, other people are speaking. Also, the questions, you can be putting them in the chat. At the end of the workshop, webinar will have a moment for a Q&A. So also feel free to raise your hand if you want to be speaking and we'll keep track on, on all of this. And at the same time, if there is any issues that are happening, you can put it in the chat. You can also contact Chiara through the email or through a private message. So that's on the house holdings. Uh, about CORE, what is CORE? So CORE is a project that is coordinated by AIDS Action Europe and in which uh, 24 partners from 16 EU member states, a specific project, are going to be working together trying to follow a series of strategic goals. Like the main one is to strengthen the capacity of community-led and also community-based services to provide uh, communicable diseases for marginalized communities. And also the idea is to support a change, a dialogue between community-led and community-based service providers, community networks, representative of key affected communities, and other series of stakeholders. And within that, this Knowledge Hub is one of the activities that we are doing in this project. And the idea is to foster mutual learning and also stakeholder engagement through a series of advocacy activities with all of the implementing organizations of the project, but also with other people that they are working in the field. So the Knowledge Hub as such is a bit of a combination of webinars and other materials that aim to share best practices in community health services for communities most affected by HIV, tuberculosis, and viral hepatitis, and other STIs. So also the idea is to create a bit of a place in which community organizations and partners can share the experiences, and that's the the goal of today. So for today, what do we have on the menu on the agenda? First, we will start with a presentation from Cristiana Valles, which is working for Cosmic Care and also the Catholic University of Portugal. From there, we'll be moving to Amanita Calderon Cifuentes, that is working for Transgender Europe. And then we'll have Aura Roche working in Medicinares. So I will say that without further ado, just to give more space for the discussion, we will start. And if uh, Cristiana, if you're ready to start, then I will let you go ahead. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me in this uh, event. It was also quite interesting to discuss you and to plan the, this, the, the event with you. And I think it will be very interesting also for us that we'll present and prepare presentations here. And for me, it was interesting because it was like the first time I was uh, diving a bit into the gender transformative concept itself because I... I I always talk a lot about, uh, wait, I'm sharing in the middle, sorry. Um, I'm always talking about gender responsiveness, uh, mainly applying to the drug field. And uh, this presentation gave me some space also to dive a bit. What does it mean, um, the gender responsive concepts, what, what, what they can mean in practice? So yeah, uh, my the perspective I bring here is based on my my work as a harm reduction uh, professional, uh, working mainly with people who use drugs in recreational nightlife uh, environments, uh, and also working with women, uh, street involved women, uh, you know, like in in some community based. Uh, volunteering work and also in some research projects I had been in, involved and it is based also in some reflection discussions conversations with several colleagues uh, because we are we are still learning and exchanging a lot and uh, you know connecting with the feminist theory and with the queer theory and trying to intersect these concepts with the drug science and drug practices so um, it's quite a very interesting and reflexive process 
And I begin this presentation by saying that when we think about gender in outreach uh, intervention, uh, our perspective changes completely and gets very wide. And uh, it's really an opportunity for social innovation and to expand our Im imaginary empathy and care policies, uh, you know, in a, in a more inclusive and comprehensive way. So, yeah, the aim of this present the, of this um, session today is to increase understanding on gender transformative approaches in service provision, uh, with a focus on outreach and harm reduction services tar targeting. Roberto talked about marginalized people that are, you know, like with this center in the people that are involved in dynamics that are somehow excluded, impacted by intersectional inequalities. Uh, we with the uh, acts of poverty and, and economical exclusion also. Uh, so also with some authoritarianism and some dominant and uh, uh, oppressive uh, measures trying to control their behaviors and situations. So these are uh, people disproportionately impacted by inequalities, by stigma and by vulnerabilization processes. And here I, I highlighted that something that uh, I always uh, want to say, it, people are not vulnerable, you know, people are impacted by vulnerabilization processes. This is very relevant. And in a person-centered approach, we have also to stop to talk about vulnerable people, you know, like people are not vulnerable. They don't born, born vulnerable. They become vulnerable by contextual, um, several contextual uh, dimensions. And these tend to be uh, people that are underserved uh, by conventional health and social services, as all you know. And why gender matters in this discussion? Gender matters because uh, it is a very structural and system, systemic concept uh, that um, affects us or is embedded uh, in the way we are socialized, uh, in the way we we are born, we don't have you know like a perception of what does it mean gender. We don't have a performance of gender. Let's say we we born with the sex attributes, uh, and then we learn to behave and to perform gender in a certain uh, certain way that is very connected with the gender norms, with the dominant system, with the way the society we are living in. It comprehends and imposes uh, gender. Uh, and this is also an opportunity to get, or, you know, like uh, in this point of the norms, we can be very, um, how can I say, uh, we can adhere to the, to these uh, dominant social norm, norms, or we can transgress them. And uh, we are, you know, in this relation with the gender norms in the way we perform and live our lifestyle, uh, express our identities and establish our gender relations. Uh, so gender is very relevant concept on this on this level. Uh, also on the relation level, not only between our peers and other colleagues, but also with institutions that are uh, you know social structures um, with with which we will create uh, relations. Let's say. So, of course, here, um, gender matters because gender stereotypes meet with drug stigma, HIV stigma, you know, like a street work stigma and so on. So gender stereotypes uh, meet and intersect with uh, other kind of stigmas and create uh, specific, uh, very specific, um, aggravate vulnerabilization processes on one hand and create specific social penalizations and health, health penalization situations. And here, patriarchy meets with other oppression systems. For example, we all work with these marginalized populations, so we know that they are impacted by prohibitionism, abolitionism in sex work, pathologization, medicalization. These are all models that can be very oppressive and very dominant and that intersect with patriarchy and affect women, uh, trans and non-binary people in a very specific uh, way and aggravate um, uh, inequality. And also usually, uh, traditionally, health and social services tend to be androcentric. 
And more recently, uh, also inspired or the World Health Organization to address gender and to inform the practice, to evaluate the, the, the interventions and so on, uh, defined this uh, concept of gender responsiveness to evaluate the responsiveness or the level of response and how organizations are responding to gender or including gender in, in their um, in their activities. And uh, uh, until the moment, I like a lot this conceptualization because it is uh, in steps and has different definitions in terms of the level of responsiveness. So we have the gender unequal level, that is when the, the institutions perpetuate harmful norms, perpetuate stigma, exclude uh, people based on their gender identity or, or on their adherence to sexist, homophobic, uh, you know, like anti-LGBTQ hostility and so on. So here on gender inequality uh, or gender unequal uh, uh, responsiveness, we would say, or as an example, institutional violence, I think it's the more clear because it not only perpetuates, but aggravates also and excludes in a very specific um, ways. Gender blind, uh, that is, for example, the androcentrism we see in intervention is a kind of blindness to gender because it's like this universal approach this kind of, you know, like health for all, but not all have the same access, not all have the same needs. There are people with specific priorities, specificities, and so on. Uh, then we have the gender sensitive, that is the level where I know gender is important. I know the experiences are different, but still, and I advocate for social equality, but still I'm not really implementing nothing in practice. So I'm sensitive, but not really doing uh, you know implementing measures uh, then we have the gender specific that is uh, these programs that are designed programs or activities inside the specific project that target specifically for example women trans and non-binary or men who are perpetrators so specific measures to address uh, specific gender groups and to work um, and to promote uh, health, equality, social, I don't know. Uh, here on gender specific, uh, we can situate also the training activities and capacitated teams, teams that know how to deal uh, or to integrate gender and, tra and trauma informed approaches. And then we have the gender transformative um, uh, level that is the, the one everyone <laughs> wants to reach. And is the more transformational also because it is focu focused not only on promoting access to services, uh, but also on empowering and reactivating uh, the citizen, the, the, the political and citizen, uh, citizen par participation of their target groups. It considers the role of oppression systems and structural inequalities in generating harm and trauma. So it's very political uh, and sees the roots of inequality and tries to target them on, a, on, them on a norms uh, level and criticizes kind of the centralization on this, you know, like those of us who work in community intervention, we always have this vulnerability uh, at risk groups, you know, like hard to reach groups, this kind of um, uh, conceptualization of the people. And I think this uh, is very focused on harm and on these adaptive behaviors, let's say, and somehow hidden this uh, incredible human ability to survive and to be resilient and to create uh, self-care and community care and uh, infrastructures of care in general. So this peer-led, and, and by centralizing these, these dimensions, we are also centralizing the, um, these uh, innovative measures uh, led by people. Okay, so I think gender transformative is more on this level. And actually, actually, I think outreach work and harm reduction are very well positioned to um social innovate here because we are already doing this for several years on the to deal with the impacts of prohibitionism abolitionism and so on and well these these are my kind of uh takeaway messages and i would say that towards a gender transformative approach 
uh, we should move beyond exclusively health indicators. We need to, a person-centered approach is not only focused on the number of, I don't know, kits we distribute or the number of uh, people we re refer to the health system. Okay, these are health indicators. We need other indicators uh, to guarantee that we are contributing to the inclusion of those who are, you know, um, more marginalized or more um, excluded from the, the interventions uh, to embrace affirmative practices. And the, I like a lot these, these affirmative practices that are coming from uh, queer care practices also, that is this thing of affirming somehow the experiences of the people, accepting them completely um, and creating a safe space for people to self-express and to, and to exist, you know, and to perform and to develop uh, language matters. And I think here again, harm reduction uh, is pro in developing inclusive language. So it's here, I would say it's a matter of expanding even it, uh, even it even more. Um, include gender justice in our advocacy agenda to develop, you know, like this uh, community based coalitions, collaborative networks to also to expand the kind of responses we have and promote mutual learning dynamics between us and colleagues working in other areas, for example, supporting uh, queer people or uh, supporting people who experienced violence. Uh, and yeah, I said it in the beginning, we are still learning. We don't have really a lot of references. So we are creating references, probably we will do some things that are not working, improve others, but you know, it's a learning process. We don't know uh, how life is uh, after patriarchy. <laughs> so we are, you know, like giving baby steps towards it. And uh, it's also important to say here that uh, until now, most of the social innovation uh, towards gender, gender transformative approaches are based on, on professional activism and uh, organizational volunteerism. And this is very nice, but uh, you know, it's also exhausting and uh, very tiring and sometimes leads to um, to burn out. So I think we need or we need to advocate to have gender indicators included in our practices, you know, like extra budget to really develop um, inclusive approaches. So thank you very much for hearing me. That's amazing and perfectly on time. Thank you so much. Uh, before we jump into the next presentation, if there is anybody that will have any clarification question that would like to ask to Christiana, maybe the moment is now, you can raise your hand and then we can give you the, the voice turn. That's all right. If maybe the question comes at any bit later, because you're processing all the information, also you can put it in the chat and then later on we have another moment in order to be able to ask questions and maybe deepen in some of the concepts that uh, Christiana was putting forward. And for Christiana, then we're going to move into Amanita. Amanita, would you like to take it over? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see your screen. Okay, fantastic. But you cannot see my notes, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> fantastic. Okay, great. I'm going to start. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is, as I mentioned before, I'm Anita Calderon Cifuentes. I'm a trans woman from Colombia living with HIV, and I'm the HIV Research and Advocacy Officer of TPU. I was invited today to talk to you about how can we provide gender transformative services to uh, for the trans communities? How can we have a more holistic approach to sexual and reproductive health and rights? And so I'm actually extremely grateful um, for Christiana's presentation because that actually uh, clarifies a lot of things that I will be talking in here. And so maybe I will be able to have a little bit more time. I would actually like to open with a quote from Laverne Cobbs that says, then when you try to fit in, you shapeshift. 
You do everything you can to get other people to accept you, but that's not authenticity. True belonging is when you show up and allow yourself to be seen. People may be into that or they may not be. It's the scariest thing to do, but you get to belong to yourself. It's definitely lonely. I've done the shape shifting. I just feel yucky afterwards. Why did I do that? Why do I even want these people in my life? So Laverne talked about something fundamental that all trans people go through, and that is the deconstruction of cisnormativity and the acceptance of the path that we set out to when we choose ourselves against all recommendations, against all gender norms, against every threat and every warning from patriarchy, right? And it is then when we start paying the price with being trans. And that price is often a lonely and violent life. And even with all of this, for us, no price is too high to pay for the privilege of owning ourselves. And trust me, we do. That is precisely why we advocate for gender transformative approaches. Because as Christiana mentioned before, we are not here to adapt to a transformative system that erases our existence. We are here to transform and transgress such system. And what we're advocating for is a space that is concerned with redressing gender inequalities, that is aiming to empower disadvantaged populations, and that aims to move towards uh, more tra like transforming the power dynamics and structures that serve to reinforce such gender inequalities. It's uh, for us, for trans and non-binary people, gender transformative approaches are the form of care that recognizes our needs and that allows us to be seen instead of forcing us into the shape shifting that Laverne was talking about. Now, before I start talking a little bit about this, I'm going to do a really quick uh, check on on gender and sexuality because I mean, I didn't really know your background, and also because I want to test a couple of things, including uh, some definitions. Let's start with the fact that, like, what is gender, right? What is gender transformative approaches? Then, like, what is gender? Gender is a social construct. Why is this? It, it is a social construct because it's something that we have, a, um, like, in a, through culture, we have created and we have established, and it is completely de dependent on time and space. What is considered masculine today here in Germany, where I am, is not considered masculine in other parts of the world today. The same way that what was considered masculine in the 16th century in France is not considered masculine today in some parts of uh, Southeast Asia, for example. And so uh, gender and sexuality are basically two different sides of a coin. Uh, gender identity speaks about your identity as a member of a gender, whether it is male, female, something in between, a mix of both, or simply a completely different gender. Gender expression, on the other hand, speaks about how you want to show your relationship with that gender, which is often fluid and is determined by your experiences in life. For example, sometimes I like to present more as a feminine woman, sometimes I like to present more as a masculine woman, but by no means this is questioning my identity as a woman. Now, uh, then we talk, when we start talking about sexual orientation, we're talking about uh, who is subject of the attraction that I experience both physically and emotionally. This, again, is never static and it changes throughout uh, your life. And sometimes it leads to questioning your sexuality to the point where you consider yourself a queer person. Now, finally, the sex assigned at birth speaks about a biological determination based on one's genitalia and or genetic components that do not define neither your gender identity or your sexuality. This concept historically understood as binary because you basically have men and women when it comes to sex. Um, this is starting to be perceived as a spectrum defined by several other variables besides genitals and genetics, such as, for example, recombination of genes or epigenetics or the environment, the impact that the environment has on the development of your sex. And so because of the reason that science is actually pushing the understanding that we have of sex beyond the binary, and it's finally recognizing the existence of, for example, intersex people. But now the question is, how does this gender and sexuality affect our access to HIV-related services, and why are gender transformative approaches so important? Well, because transphobia and cisnormativity lead to high levels of stigma. And when we're talking about stigma, 
we mean that trans people carry a mark of disgrace associated with their gender identity, the same way that queer people carry a mark of disgrace because of their sexual orientation. What is the difference, however, between transphobia and cisnormativity? And here I would actually, I genuinely would really appreciate if all of like the ones that know the difference, please raise your hand in here. I wanna know how many of us know, how many of us don't know what is the difference between transphobia and cisnormativity? Raise your hand if you do. You can raise your hand um, as a reaction. We have not that many people <laughs> for what I can say. We have Roberto Sabrina, okay, we have, uh -huh. okay, we have a minority. So this is actually really, really important um, because what, like the, like the difference between transphobia and systematicity, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that quite often makes us question ourselves. So transphobia is the irrational, fear, hate, and disgust towards the trans communities, right? And quite often, uh, this irrational fear is rooted into a lot of different things that I'm not going to talk about today. This transphobia usually leads to macroaggressions such as murders or physical violence. However, cisnormativity is a lot more sneaky. Cisnormativity is the set of social, cultural, and systemic rules that determined that one should be cisgender, one should relate to cisgender people, one should um, uh, only marry or fall in love with cisgender people. And, and the thing is that these, these, these set of rules are often responsible for a lot of different microaggressions that people are not even aware of the fact that they're uh, committing um, simply because they live under the cis norm. And um, both transphobia and cis normativity lead to these um, to this mark of disgrace associated to gender identities that are not normative. And this at the same time leads to really high levels of violence, discrimination and harassment against the communities that define our access to all sectors of society, employment, education and health, among others. Now, these specific forms of violence, discrimination and harassment are not only tailored by our gender identity, there is a very important intersectional component in here, and that is determined by all of the social demographic, uh, socially, uh, social demographic characteristics that we have, whether it is um, gender identity, sexual orientation, gender, race, specifically race, and migration status. And here I want to say something very important. Gender is not just a social construct, it's also a, a racial construct. For the gender binary and the roles that men and women play in the society as we know it today cannot could have nothing defined without colonialism and so the binary gender the gender norms and the, the gender roles were created on the basis of white supremacy and precisely with the purpose of putting white people above the other the other races and today we experience this in the healthcare settings especially for example on the levels and trans people have to reach of the testosterone and estrogens which have been defined on the basis of cisgender white people, not even people of color. So now moving on from this, I'm very happy to talk about this more in the future, but it's just to give you an idea that these further marginalized communities, as, as I like to call them, because I agree with Christiane, I don't like to call these communities vulnerable, these further marginalized because we've been marginalized because of the intersections between our identities, experience higher forms of violence, discrimination and harassment, and not in an additive way, but in a way that is uh, transverse, trans, trans, in, in a way that is transversal. So each combination of uh, privileges and oppressions will give us very specific type of experiences where sometimes we will have a privilege over others and sometimes we'll have, we'll be oppressed over others. But how does this reflect in the well-being of trans people? When it comes to HIV, it reflects very clearly. Trans feminine people have uh, 60, 66 times higher odds than the general public of contracting HIV, while trans masculine people have 6.8 times higher odds of contracting HIV than the general public. What is the general public? People living between the ages of 15 to 49 that identify as cisgender, meaning um, people that identify with the sex that was assigned at the time of birth. This was a, a re reported in a meta-study made by Sarah Sutterman published in 2021. 
And what are the social dynamics leading to this high prevalence? Well, what we have found in the research here at TGU is that um, trans people often experience a lack of empathy and strong disdain from a really early age, especially coming from um, caretakers. So neglective, violent, or abandoned parents, and also the type of um, spaces that we share in school or simply on our daily basis. Then when we reach adulthood, we often experience extreme poverty, sexual, psychological, physical, systemic, and emotional violence, discrimination, and harassment in every sector, as mentioned before. And there's also a rooted and haunting sense of loneliness, as it's been um, presented here in this data. We often also have the need to validate our gender identity and sexuality, not just as everyone does, but we have been more limited by the culture in doing so. And we're also just have this desire to explore different forms of intimacy other than the ones reinforced by the cis heteropatriarchy, such as monogamy or the understanding of family or the way that we want to alter and senses and, and enjoy sex. All of these things and all of these understandings um, of, of how we should explore and enjoy our sexuality are so this hetero regulated and normed that when we slightly leave outside this, this type of uh, behaviors, it becomes criminalized. And that is the case of recreational drug use, that is the case of sex work, and that is, uh, or simply just culturally judged uh, when you have high levels of, like a high uh, amount of sexual partners, and then you just consider a slot or a whore, which is something that happens a lot more among females, uh, women. So these type of sexual practices, however, they do lead to an increase of the risk of contracting HIV. Um, and if we move on uh, other parts of the HIV continuum of care, such as sex testing, HIV diagnosis, prevention, or treatment, quite often these, all of this stigma and this transphobia and sensitivity that I have talked to you about um, lead to um, lack of access or lack of availability of such services presented in the HIV continuum of care for trans people. I'm naming a couple of things in here, but I want you to focus on the fact that in Europe, as it is today, only 22 countries consider trans people eligible to have access to PrEP. And from these 22 countries, not all of them offer these services for free. So for a community that has been often pushed into poverty, especially trans people of color, it's very difficult for us to afford uh, such services. And so what happens at the end is that we just simply do not uh, aim to, uh, to tackle or to access the services, right? And in many ways, this is also determined by the fear that we have and the distress that we have against the healthcare system. So what can we do about this? How can we overcome this? Specific health and human services, service practices and policies tailored to trans and binary and gender non-conforming people could improve their healthcare experiences and advance health equity for them all. And so gender transformative approaches challenge the cis heteropatriarchy the gender norms and bringing sex positivity into the equation. And that is the reason why my first point to take home here is to deconstruct our understanding of gender and sexuality and include a sex positive perspective on recreational drug use, sex work, sexual practices. And all of this is fundamental for providing a proper gender transformative approach. Now, it is also really important besides deconstructing all of the prejudices that we have for being raised in a transphobic and cis normative world, which is also understanding, we also need to um, understand the social and economical dynamics behind transphobia and cis normativity and the impact they have on the well-being of trans people. So basically, I'm inviting you to educate yourself so you can have more empathy, kindness, and compassion. Finally, peer-to-peer -peer work is fundamental to build bridges between further marginalized community and healthcare professional service authorities, uh, healthcare services and healthcare authorities. This means hire more trans and non-binary people in your staff and give them decision power to shape the services you're providing. Finally, tackle the never-ending cycle of trauma that pushes trans people into mental instability by advocating for anti-discrimination and anti-hate speech and crime laws, policies, and practices among staff, colleagues, and stakeholders. This is a political issue, and you have to address it as a political issue, not just as a health issue. Finally, and as a reminder, gender affirming care and recognition of our identities through legal gender recognition will reduce minority stress and will increase adherence and accessibility 
uh, to HIV related services to trans people and therefore it needs to be a fundamental part of gender reformative, uh, transformative approaches uh, in the HIV related service settings. Thank you. I'm the one minute extra. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for this presentation. You cover a lot of ground and really precisely. Thank you so much. Is there any questions that anybody might have for Amanita before we move forward? Okay, middle of the day. We are still feeling shy, although we introduced each other in the chat. So we are gonna let you another presentation to warm up to the idea of having a dialogue all together. So think of it. <laughs> and then I will give the floor to Aura Roche, that is the director of Medicineris. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much. I don't know what is going on here. Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Then I'm gonna share the screen before. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, ama it's amazing to, have, to be in this panel with such an amazing woman. Um, I'm going to share, uh, uh, let me talk here. Okay, then I come to talk about Medzineras. Uh, Medzineras were the women who use drugs or plants as a remedy or as a poison during the Middle Ages. Uh, when we are talking about the war on drugs, we always located at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the the 20th century, uh, not in a neutral way, it began with the opium wars against the Chinese population, it follows in the 50s against the cannabis with that was the plant uh, chosen by the uh, Mexicans that were crossing uh, to the States. We can have other episodes of the war on drugs um, that will be in the 60s against uh, psychedelics and the hippies that also were fighting against the system, were being feminist, ecologist, uh, pacifist, etc. We can continue in the 80s, no? for example, against the, with all the discussion around the crack babies that were not the crack babies, it were babies of black women surviving violence and a lot of um, uh, poverty between others, uh, and I want to remember that the war on drugs began really early against women, and it began against these medicineras that were uh, women that also used plants uh, for the wellness of their communities, that they know how to use the plants uh, to take care of their reproductive uh, health, for example, and not just uh, for their own well-being, but also the well-being of their communities. Um, from there, we can uh, follow up how the stigma and the criminalization of women who use drugs. And when I'm talking about women, I'm not talking about just um, cis women or even trans women. I'm talking about people that don't identify as men. Um, and in fact, this kind of criminalization and also erotization, sexualization is still working nowadays, no? Uh, and I am aware that I'm talking from a really privileged environment. I come from Barcelona. We have had harm reduction strategies for over 30 years. Like our first um, Cannabis Social Club was in the, uh, in 91 of the past century. Our first uh, supervised consumption room was in 2003. Um, in 2016, when I came back uh, to Barcelona, I was coming from Colombia, learning for the amazing community work. Yes, I'm an I learned a lot from your country. I just came. <laughs> Uh, past week uh, from there, just to remember where we need to be. And what uh, I had been uh, far away from Barcelona for seven years, and when I arrived, I realized that even 
having all the harm reduction services, what we found these women are not arriving to these harm reduction services. Also, harm reduction was super important because of course saves lives, but people is not living, is surviving because we are not tackled. We were not tackling the structural causes of inequality and exclusion and marginalization. And um, yeah, women were not arriving to the drug services, not harm reduction, not treatment. They represent 15%. Uh, we don't have numbers about trans people, even nowadays, not numbers. We know that the representation in that places is really low. Um, one, two percent at the most. Uh, they decided not to take data because one uh, give enough data, no, will um, um, disrupt um, the results that we have if we focus on uh, making sure that we we can uh, take the data of all at the spec the gender spectrum. Uh, anyway. What we found is that women don't arrive to the drug uh, services, but they don't arrive either to the other, to the rest of the standardized networks, not the networks for uh, people, for women surviving violence because they are using drugs, not to the mental health networks because they are using drugs, not to the how homeless uh, services because they are using drugs. Then what we have is that, yeah, we have had 30 years of harm reduction, but also we can see the limits, and especially we can see the limits when we are talking about women and gender non-conforming people. It's because that in 2016, we began with the network of women who use drugs. Um, and in 2017, finally, we had some money to put in place some services. Um, it was amazing because we tried, we conformed the first nonprofit cooperative uh, exclusive for uh, women and gender non conforming people um, who use drugs. This holistic, uh, holistic perspective, but also really individualized framework um, that we want with this principles you can see like genuine creativity we know that the protocols are not working we need to challenge protocols we need to think outside the boat the box we found a lot of services that expel women that are not following the rules we decide that we need to radical tenderness we cannot bar anybody from our services behind us there is nothing it is the streets then we need to make sure that everybody is welcome Resilience is not individual, it's collective. Road scorers, because we began without asking permit, and now that we have more than 500 members in Metineros, we don't gonna have pardon. We don't gonna ask for pardon. We are looking for a building. Um, we think that, that the care has to be in the center. Uh, and also, we are doing this care not from this paternalistic point of view, but from the activism perspective, from this mutual support um, in Medzineras, we try to break this difference between staff or workers and participants or technical experts and participants. We are here all together fighting to, to make sure uh, that the rights of people who use drugs and specifically the rights of women and gender non-conforming people who use drugs are um, not just respected, but also uh, improved. Um, of course, we are really committed with the anti-prohibitionism. We cannot do anything with the things that are prohibited. They don't disappear. They just uh, become more precar precarious. Transdisciplinarity, all together, we need this view this complex view because we are in front of a really complex problem and transformative passion uh, we are not trying just to provide services the services are important to be able to transform the reality when we are talking about when we are working with women 
with people that is living in the streets that are facing a lot of different kinds of vulnerabilities. No? Uh, what we did is to open a place uh, when we didn't put the drug, uh, the drug use in the center. We take it into account, but it is not in the center. And it allows to arrive to a lot of uh, women. Right now, we have uh, 529 women involved in our place. Um, around 20% are trans, um, trans women, a little bit uh, more. And uh, around 20% also, uh, around 6% uh, non-binary gender folks. Um, and you can see how complex is the reality that the, the people that is coming to Medineras as 80% have a, a mental health diagnosis, 40% are uh, identifying LGBTQ community, 53% um, um, are being sex work, but when we see how many women are using sex to survive, the number is higher, uh, is much higher. Uh, when we are talking about homeless, uh, roofless women literally sleeping in the street, we are talking about the 70 percent. But when we see how many women <coughs> don't have a safe place to stay, they don't have a home, the number is much higher. And of course, we can say that they have drug related problems, but as we can see, we have a lot of different problems and drugs are one of the tools that most of these women have to survive all these multiple situations of violence and vulnerabilities because the hundred percent of the women that are coming to Medzineras um, are surviving violence. And sorry, I forgot to say um, all the violence that come from the racism and as you can see, 43% of the women that come to Medzineras have migratory experience, 30% are racialized, and we could go on and on about what the consequences of all of that has, the criminalization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when we are talking about what kind of drug use, we can see that drug use, predom the polydrug use predominates. I don't wanna go into that. Uh, longer, but we want to say the, do the difference between what are the drugs that you are using and what are the drugs that you have problem with, because it's not the same. Um, uh, when we are talking about what kind of violence they are surviving, we can see how these women are um, overrepresented on women that are surviving violence uh, during the childhood. Um, but also the violence that they survive during the adulthood doesn't come just because their partners or their family of strangers. It comes from the criminalization and from the exclusion and the stigma that they survive from the social and healthcare, and of course, the structural violence that um, Amanita and Christiana has been tackling in the last presentation in a brilliant way. Then what we do in Medzineras, and sorry for this uh, uh, introduction, but I think that is important. We try to, we put the women and the, gender, the members of Medzineras in the center. Everybody uh, is the one who decides which is their own way, their own path to uh, improve their wellness, their physical wellness, their uh, emotional wellness, and the, their um, psychological well-being. Um, we try to reduce the barriers to arrive uh, to the standardized networks of, um, of uh, attention. Um, also, um, we support the women as um, the main interlocutors, like not just because in Medzineras uh, we have like, the community technicians. We don't like to talk about peer workers because from an intersectional perspective, who is peer and who is not, no? Also, the, the, we, are, we try to 
um, to have women, we have women uh, with experience in the design, the implementation, the monitoring, the evaluation of all our actions, but also we push to make sure that they are uh, taken into account uh, in all the plans and policies that are gonna impact their lives. Um, and I'll have a love couple of minutes. Okay. I'll have a couple of what? minutes more. A couple of minutes okay. more. Running. Okay. Then we are going to the streets. We love to be in the streets. Uh, what we have is a place, a safe place, where they have social worker, a lawyer, a psychologist. They can use drugs safely because we have a safe place to use whatever drugs you want. And also, we have a lot of fun. We love to go out. We like to get involved in our community. We do go to demonstrations and we do a lot of different workshops. Past year, we opened at Casa Marian, that is a place for women that are criminalized, um, where we can provide with alternative measures to imprisonment. We go to prison to visit them. We represent them when, we, when they don't have a real lawyer. We do a lot of things. Planning, monitoring, and evaluation. Uh, we have this amazing database with new indicators because we are we really want to make sure that we recollect information that is meaningful for the women that we are accompanying. Uh, also, with non-intrusive research tools, we don't do any kind of questionnaire, it's not conditioned, but we spend a lot of time having coffee with the women and going to our database and systematizing this information. We can talk more about that. Uh, we do a lot of materials also that come from the knowledge of women. This is the, um, we can talk about this methodology also, but first we talk with the women, we learn from what they have to teach, and we go to the community, the scientific community, ask if everything that the women have say is true. Normally, 90% of the time, 99% is true. Then we put all these things that are in these super complex articles in a simple way that everybody can understand and we share this information in a funny way where they feel represented. With all of this, we have been considered as a good practice, even for UNODC. Then you can see our experience in a lot of places. I cannot uh, explain you everything and I cannot do, put you the video, but you can go to all our media channels and you can check for yourself all the information that you want. And thank you so much. Sorry for the time. <laughs> thank you thank very you much, uh, Aura. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much, Aura. Uh, um, well, I think that um, it's now the the moment from the um, from the Q and A from the questions uh, from the questions, uh, but I would like to maybe kick out the the conversation and answer whoever uh, you you feel or the panelists that feels like um, entitled to to answer. But um, for example, uh, what what alternatives are there to providing gender affirmation services in countries where these procedures are pre prohibited? If someone would like to answer the question, I don't know if I'm Anita, maybe. So can you repeat the question? Because the thing is that it's, uh, yeah. it seems, yeah. Yeah, what alternatives are there to providing uh, gen uh, gender affirmation services or HIV prevention services or you know, healthcare services in countries with, um, to these populations where these procedures are prohibited? Okay, so first. are we talking about gender transformative services or okay? So what? Yeah, let's yeah. provide it too. Okay, so because it's just saying here gender affirmation services and yeah. and so gender affirmation services is like so are we talking because it's different from gender transformative services? Yeah. But okay, so I will tackle this this um from the um, from the very lived experience that uh, each and every single 
trans person here has had, especially if we are from the global south, which is that like most places in the world, um, I mean, if you are a trans person above the age of 35 you and you are a migrant from the global south, you most likely have been uh, criminalized by your identity at some point, right? Uh, whether it is that um, you were... Uh, persecuted or whether it is that your identity was not recognized and you were invisible to the world or um, or it, there was just cultural shame, right? And what we do is that we um, organize, uh, we unify as a community and we take care of each other. That's the main uh, alternative that we have when the system either erases us or persecutes us and that is what's currently happening in like in neighboring countries Poland, Russia, Romania, Hungary, pretty much everyone in Eastern Europe and Central Asia at the time and many places uh, in uh, in other like in, in countries from the global south um, and so um, usually when when the uh, identities are criminalized or when the services are simply not provided because they're not um, recognized as a need from the community, what we usually do is that the community gathers and what we, we take care of each other. And that's what you can historically see from groups like ACT UP in New York um, that were the first response to HIV from the queer and trans communities, both groups led by people of color and migrants uh, from the global south um, and it is pretty much what you're looking in here, right? I mean, what is the GU or what is ESBA uh, or what is the relation, if not um, civil society of organizations that are uni like getting together and, and trying to uh, influence policymakers through uh, data and research and lived experiences uh, to try to configure such environment into an environment that is less hostile. But the alternative so far has been that community support, which is actually the reason why um, we need more and more allies. But those allies cannot happen if you do not deconstruct your transphobia, your queerphobia, your whorephobia, your racism, your anti-blackness, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much for the great answer, Amanita. Um, Aura, yes? Um, yeah, I would love, thank you, Amanita, your answer was brilliant. Um, I think that also what we found is that just to have a place where women can look at their eyes between each other, not being criminalized, just being in the same place, being able to talk about their strategies of survival is just revolutionary. And this is not possible, especially when we are talking about people that has to be most of the time in totally androcentric spaces, no? Or really mixed spaces where they cannot share in a safe way this, no? And just to procure a safe space where we can share these strategies when we don't judge each other is being revolutionary. From there on, I think that between us, we have a lot of resources that when we have these uh, spaces where we can grow together on that, we are really resourceful uh, to make sure that we can um, find ways to, to improve our daily lives in that sense. Thank you very much, Aura. Um, is there any question from the public that maybe you can or jump in or write in the chat? and I can read it if you are shy. Wow, apparently it's like super clear with the presentation. There are no questions. <laughs> but I have another one. Um, how can we ensure that like, given the context of wars and everything uh, going around and being Europe uh, as the center of uh, attraction for many of us that are uh, running away from different situations, how can we ensure the um, gender sensitive services for uh, uh, all this population? It's a tricky question, I know. So how can we, yes, Amanita? I'm just, I'm just going to ask, 
how can we we who exactly yeah we, exactly we, right. we... It's, uh, it doesn't say like in general we maybe civil society maybe um stakeholders maybe it's a very broad question also maybe for the um for the public why not yeah. Sorry, I missed the question. Can you repeat it? Sorry. Yes. Uh, how can we ensure gender sensitive services for gay and trans uh, trans people and women and migrant women running from the different wars that we have? We need to involve. We... Sorry. We need to involve them in the beginning, from from the beginning, the design, the implementation, the monitoring, kind of and the uh, evaluation of the services we need to make sure that we are with the community that we want to work with and we need to build that services together no and this is for me the basic yeah i would like to add to that that we would first have to also start by questioning the terribly xenophobic laws that european countries have because how are we going to provide a service to an asylum seeker if the asylum seeker is not eligible for such service? Because like this is not an issue that um, uh, like a prison uh, from Europe is experiencing. If the service is provided in your country, if you're a European person, you can have access to it. But if you are an asylum seeker, a refugee, or a migrant, an undocumented migrant, there's a big chance that you won't. And in many cases, again, like going back to the whole point of intersectionality, um, the people that are running the most from the places that are hostile are people that are in a specific uh, cases of marginalization. So we have a lot of trans people, especially trans feminine people migrating from the global south into Europe. And these are in a vast majority, if not almost all of them, racialized uh, trans feminine people. We're talking about black and brown trans women and trans feminine people that come to Europe and then get denied all of the services and then also like access to any type of employment or any type of education. And so you ended up doing sex work, you ended up doing this, 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 that. And so again, it's all about deconstructing the bigotry of the system. And I mean, I'm going to say something that probably a lot of people here might agree with. We really need to bring, bring cisgender heterosexual men into this conversation because like, I mean, regardless how much distrust and how much anger I am hearing within regarding in, in, in direction of that specific subset of the population, the reality is that men are also marginalized and oppressed by patriarchy. And that, and it's also true that the more mm, they get to experience the benefits from, from feminism and queerness, the less they will uh, be perpetrators of the crimes that are currently being committed, including the systemic ones, including the creation of all of the systems and all of these laws. But what do we also need to do? We need to bring men into this. We need to bring them. I mean, sleep with them, flirt with them, do whatever it takes, but bring them into the side of the fight. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Totally agree with you. Yeah. And and uh, and also the, bring their money because they have the the, the financial resources as well, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I thought that I, I can yeah, I sure, add sure, sure, Christiana. Yes, um, of course. Just to add to what Aura and Manita said, I was uh, thinking from the perspective of a service provider, and it. I was also thinking in the experiences we have with migrants, for example. So I would say it would be relevant to think in the language obstacles because language is a very concrete obstacle. Also, you know, these things we learn from multiculturalism and uh, queer perspectives of the language of cultural competence. So probably we would need to develop some cultural competence, maybe involving participatory approaches to, you know, to involve some people and uh, understand the dynamics and the needs and priorities, not only the needs, but also the priorities. And, um, and trauma informed, I would say to, you know, to um, try to think or to apply trauma informed principles, because these are people with probably very vivid and very recent extreme trauma experiences from, you know, leaving their countries in our context, grieving and so on. So I would say this would also be relevant. 
and um, I don't know, maybe to increase collaboration with organizations working with uh, migrants and uh, I don't know, like to try to build, you know, a community, a community based, you know, dynamic to really promote, uh, I don't know, response to emerging needs or priorities of these groups. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christiana, for your answer. Um, yeah, but uh, we have a question from uh, Abib Mola. Um, so with the rise of the far-right extremism in Europe now, will, will it be in place to make a smart advocacy with moderate politicians within the EU Parliament regarding transphobia? We'll see. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's see the composition. Let's see how that goes, yeah. I think that um, I really want to believe that within even uh, the lines of conservative members of the parliament and, and other sectors of the EU, uh, there is or there might be space for debate. Uh, this is a form of hope that I have that I should probably not have. Like I should most almost definitely not believe that this is possible. But um, I also do want to believe that the work that we do is not just, um, it doesn't just come from the arguments that we're presenting as uh, researchers and academics, but because of the type of advocacy comes from a place of lived experiences, there is, um, there's always a window of opportunity for us to target or connect and increase empathy and kindness towards the communities. Um, and quite often I have experienced that that is a lot more productive than presenting data sometimes. Um, when you actually get uh, people to put yourself, put themselves in your shoes for five seconds, um, it um, sometimes is, it's a lot more um, conductive to things. And I want to believe that that's still possible and that the people that have been elected recently are still middle minds that get, get to be seduced into the dark side of the forest. <laughs> Thank you, Manita. That's a great answer. No one else? How are we doing with the time? It's, we're almost there, right? Um, yeah, I see a hand there. Uh, um, Anisabel and um, yeah, yes. and then Christiana. Thank you for this. I had double microphone. So, uh, and Isabel from EATG. Thank you for this amazing um, uh, intervention and presentation. I was just wondering, uh, what is your number, like what is your main challenge and uh, lessons learned from the, you know, from the service provision? And I ask this to, to, to Alra, but also to all of the the participants who are in the delivering services. What was the question? Sorry. Sorry. What was what has been your main like your main challenge? Um, and then maybe a lessons learned uh, from this challenge that you know that you've managed to overcome. Um, I guess there I, are many challenges, I suppose, in, in many, are, many challenges. Money. But, money. Um, I will say our main challenge is money. Like, yeah. our main challenge, yeah, of course, is money. Like, um, and how difficult it is uh, in Europe to begin a new organization from zero right now, no, with the, and the, in, in the middle of all these institutionalized uh, harm reduction services, no, that that is really difficult to um, to be able to 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 challenge the protocols inside the system that is totally medicalized and institutionalized, no, then how we can be disobedient in the middle of all of this, we manage, but it needs a lot of creativity. And I think that the main barrier and why we cannot do whatever we needs to be done is because we don't have money enough. Another challenge is how we can 
uh, provide these services where we don't have uh, staff that is trained in this new perspective. No, we need to begin from from zero with no money, uh, with a lot of precarity because we cannot pay good salaries. Um, to a staff that is coming from universities, some of them that never heard about harm reduction, never heard about um, trauma center approaches, they don't talk about the structural causes of inequality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and how we can do that in services that cannot provide the care for the staff members that we need because we don't have money, you know, but we know that being in the front line is super hard. They are facing a lot of different challenges, violence, uh, trauma. Uh, they don't have all the tools that they need, but they need to answer to the women that are coming to our services and they go to their homes and we cannot provide them with the care for their mental health and their emotional health that they need after facing all of this, no, because we are really precarious on doing that. And also, no, like, uh, I think that this is a main goal, no? Uh, in our case, we didn't find a lot of barriers from the institutions. I, we thought that we will find more barriers but we entered uh, not through the drug department, we entered more through the feminist department. This is another part of our privilege. We have a feminist department, which is not really usual. And I think that this is one of the, has been amazing because from the feminist department, they already have their um, intersectional perspective. Then it has been, I think that the step that was needed in the harm reduction services in, in Catalonia that see that this is not it, it is not about drugs, it's about people with a lot of different serving multiple situations of vulnerabilities and violence. And coming from the feminist perspective, this intersectional perspective was easier because this I think that this is the step that we need to go forward, no? To recognize that and to um, and I think that the other uh, challenge is the barriers that we found in all the, these standard and standardized networks uh, of support. Then what we need to work is to break these barriers, no? And I think that this is another challenge, no? Uh, show that when we are talking about, um, yeah, you were talking about that. One of the biggest barriers is the is the migration, no? Is the laws against migration? Then we need to challenge that. We need to challenge the penal system. We need to challenge gentrification because it's one of the um, uh, biggest barriers that uh, the per people that are coming to our services have to develop a feeling of belonging, no? Then I think that bringing harm reduction in this or drug policy in this wider uh, perspective is one of the main challenges that we have. Sorry, it's two and I'm like, it's three here and I haven't eaten anything that I am a little bit slow. Sorry. About that. <laughs> no worries, we will we'll be over in some more, more minutes. Uh, uh, Christiana, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I have a or question. Comment. Yes. Um, but but first, I I, I will uh, everything I already said regarding the budget and the funding. Uh, but for us at Cosmic Air, what was interesting or relevant, or you know, like um, was the definition of our political commitment or our vision for gender transformativeness in our organization? You know, like what really we want to do so we change the way we communicate and our the language we use we try to uniformize it and uh, you know like we took several decisions from this beginning from this initial brainstorm let's say defining what in our organization we would commit with you know like so i think this is a recommendation i leave for other organizations interested in beginning this process because sometimes it's not in us or several times it's not enough to have a workshop for women or, you know, like a workshop, uh, you know, like 
it's not enough. It's structural, and you have to begin rethinking on the organizational level. So, well, it's my recommendation. My question, I'm sorry, Aura, you want to have lunch, but it's uh, mostly for you. Because in Spain, you are super advanced, and you have a lot of you know, initiatives, and you have support and budget is not enough, but still you have more than most of other countries, Portugal included. It's like we do everything, uh, you know, like with our professional activism and volunteerism, we don't have support, we don't have money. Sometimes we have, for example, we had now uh, uh, 20 months of funding for developing resources, you know, but then the implementation, it's not paid. So, well, it's always this on, on this level. And I heard for you before, and I think this is nice for you, that is uh, what is like to implement or to be in a country uh, that, for example, demands a lot for LILAC points or is paying, there is money to be invested in gender approaches. And I heard you on the other events in Spain you had been about this capitalization or capitalism around, you know, like uh, some... I don't know if maybe it was not you, but um, you know th this risk of uh, having money and the wrong people without you know the. Um... Sorry, I'm being very confused. But I would like to know how it is to be in a place uh, because maybe the future, the perfect future, will would will be with funding available and everyone applying. But uh, what are the challenges here? Very confused. For sorry. Us, like, okay, I'm not sure if I understand. I don't talk about the Spain because it's totally different. The drug policy and all of harm reduction and all of this in the rest of Spain. I'm talking from Barcelona. Catalonia was really special in that sense because in the night in the nineties, all the political parties signed an agreement of not using drug policies or harm reduction as a weapon between parties. And it was super important, was a political decision that allowed to develop all these harm reduction services without the noise of different political parties fighting against one against uh, the others using harm reduction as a, as a weapon. It was crucial, it was really important. Um, and we have the same problem that they give you money for uh, pro projects, but not for a structure. But when you have a lot of projects and you have 20 people working, you need uh, someone that knows about human resources. You need someone who knows about uh, money and you need people because one of the problems is that these kind of grants, yeah, they give you the grants but you need to justify the grants and you need to hire people just for that because it's a, a degree of expertise that is huge. When I was working, sorry, I come back, no? When I was working in Colombia, was it was different because we had a huge challenge to find the money, but the money who provide the, but the organization that provide you the money is like, okay, we know that you are doing a good job, do the job. And they trust a little bit more what you are doing. And you not, don't need to go uh, to justify every single penny. No? Then I think that we challenge we, we, um, for big organizations to justify every penny is easy. And also they have money for a structure. But for a small organization, this is super difficult because you have just one project and you need to justify any penny how are we going to justify how we pay the the community technicians when they don't have pay documentation when they don't have you know like there is some kind of challenge of how we can develop these services we need to be really creative in that sense um then and also how we make sure that the money arrives to the services that needs to be arrived. What we have been, uh, cha another challenge that we have been facing lately is this kind of, uh, yeah, everybody's talking about gender sensitive services now. Everybody doing gender sensitive services. This is not true, but we put the language. 
we put the practice and we put the language and they take the language but they forgot the practice then this is a huge challenge that we have right now everybody is using the same language but how many are really involved people who use drugs in the design the implementation the monitoring and the and the evaluation of the services but everybody is talking about putting the people in the center no, but putting the people in the center is not what is going on, but the language is totally uh, extended. I'm not sure if I answered your question, Christiana, but... You did. <laughs> Good. Amanita, yes? Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to that, um, because so I was, I was thinking about two things. Uh, well, or uh, I was um, speaking and it's that like on one hand um, funding can be extremely limiting sometimes in the sense that sometimes you receive funding that just basically does not let you do the work that you have to do right and then you need to be very question like you need to be very critical about this this type of funding that you receive and but also at the same time you need to be very realistic about the fact that the system uh, or way for example the EU decides to give a grant is a system that is designed to push away certain communities so if you don't have a certain level of education for example a master's degree then you cannot apply for this and how do you get a master's degree if you didn't finish high school because you were kicked out from your house for being queer or trans let's start with that um how do you access to this this type of uh, requirements that are not just elitist but are fundamentally just racist and xenophobic um, and because all of these intersections like just meet what you ended up with is uh, wanting to have a trans-led organization that is doing trans rights advocacy but not being able to hire anyone that is trans because not because very few trans people have the education level that is required according to the grant that you're working with and then so quite often what happens is that the responsibility falls into these one, two, three peoples from further marginalized communities that, yes, are trans and racialized and migrants and, and sex workers and drug users, but also happen to have an education that allows them to do the work that they're doing, right? Like Sabrina, you being an example for that, I've been an example for that. And then just suddenly it just becomes like, this person is the only person that can do the work. And what we realize from this is that it's completely unsustainable. So um, one of the things that we can do and that you can do to challenge that is to making sure that you are filling up the gaps by training, like providing training and providing support to those that you can provide support. Because yeah, it's all very cute when we are, you know, when we have, uh, when we we are implementing this uh, gender transformative services, but if we don't fill up the gaps for the further marginalized communities to take on the work that some of us are, are doing, then it's just simply not sustainable and we're never gonna really reach anywhere. So. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to hire, for example, someone uh, in any of like your organizations or um, in a healthcare um, setting or any of the, any of this, and it's a further marginalized member of a community, then make sure you might find uh, gaps in this person that this person might not have um, education on certain topics, and then I. If, if you really want to support the community, then it is up to you to fill up those gaps and to train the person as much as necessary for as long as this person uh, can amplify, like as for as long as you can eventually amplify the voice of this person. Because otherwise, you're just basically, um, Sabrina, what is the name for this? When you use someone as a token, tokenism is not tokenism and you're doing absolutely nothing for anyone. Thanks. Uh, yes, I see uh, Leon Rotkin uh, at your hand raised. You could jump in. Hello. Um, my question is for Aura. So um, you talked about your trans and non-binary clients that are engaging in chemsex. Um, chemsex people are notoriously hard to engage in services. Um, how do you ensure that um, your service users engage as much as possible? Estás en silencio ahora. Estás, ahora, ya. Ahora, yeah. Okay, uh, we don't believe that there are people that is hard to engage. We don't just believe that 
the services are not done uh, well enough if we are not arriving to the people. And this is because we are doing that without the people that we want to engage. No, uh, then this is a huge difference. When you are doing that, the people that needs the service, they get engaged because they define the services that they want. Then I'm not really agree on that. I I I I think that that the problem is different. You know, like um, we, if they are not engaging, it's because the services is not needed. The services that we are providing is not needed or we are not arriving to the places that we need to arrive and i go back to my my first uh affirmation that is that you need the people from the community that you want to serve get involved from the beginning and you don't gonna have this problem at all like for sure then this is the difference uh as soon as you open the doors and you open the doors with them with the community the community arrive and they get involved and they make the service grow in a measure that maybe we're gonna die <laughs> because the exit that it has you know but um i think that this will be the, the main thing and of course you need to go where the people is at like if you are opening a service when it's not needed uh, or you are talking in a language that the people that you want to serve doesn't understand they don't gonna get engaged anyway but as soon as you are with the people, of course, it's going to be successful if it is needed. Thank you and very much, Sara. Great answer. Thank you. So, Roberto, yes. Yeah, I'm saying I was seeing Marianela saying goodbye, and I think it's a bit the moment for all of us. Goodbye, Marianela. The moment to be wrapping up, we have been one hour and a half, and I have the feeling that with a level of passion, knowledge that everybody has in this room, we will continue for another one hour and a half, and perhaps we need to organize another moment to continue dialoguing. In the meantime, uh, just quickly mentioning that there is more of these knowledge hub moments in which community can come together and create just a space for sharing and exchange. So yes, you can scan this QR code. You can go to the website and you will find all the agenda, also, CORE is organizing another series of workshops in which there is community trainers in which they are giving skills, methods, and tools for different communities to be really able to develop uh, communicable diseases, community-based and community-related communicable diseases. And I think that uh, after this short announcement of the coming events, we can wrap it up. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Thank you so much. Christiana, thank you so much. Manita, Aura, Chiara, and Anis. That also have been really involved working behind the scenes, doing a lot of things in here. And uh, yeah, until the next Knowledge Hub. And if you have questions, send an email to Kiara. Have a good day.